Our very special guest this week is Dr. John Mather, Senior Astrophysicist at the Observational Cosmology Group at our laboratory at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, Dr. Mather started out working uh, on the COBE proposal in the mid-1970s, joined the mission design. COBE being the cosmic background. Co yeah, COBE being the cosmic microwave, uh, cosmic back uh, microwave background explorer. And saw this, this mission through to its launch, its data gathering um, phase, and eventual identification of the fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background that are one of the signatures of Big Bang cosmology. I, I thought it was particularly funny. I was in grad school at the time and taking a, ge a general relativity class, and the, one of the professors remarked that, boy, we're glad they finally saw that. <laughs> so. Anyway, uh, so he's here to talk to us, uh, give his presentation from the Big Bang to the Nobel Prize in honor of the James Webb Space Telescope and the discovery of alien life. Um, Dr. Mather won the Nobel Prize in 2006 for that work with Kobe, and uh, so I'll turn it over to Dr. Mather. Well, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, is the microphone for me also working? Can you hear me in the back? Okay. Um, so I will not answer all your questions, uh, but I like them. So uh, sometimes I just can't answer because we, nobody actually knows the answer to some of the questions that are most interesting and exciting today. But at any rate, welcome. I'm happy to talk with you. Uh, after I do my charts, we'll have a chance to answer your questions, and maybe I can. So um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what astronomers are doing to answer these great questions and how we're doing it, and also to try to summarize the Big Bang story for you that may not have already uh, internalized and uh, accepted the uh, implausible nature of what we actually seem to find. Uh, so let me start with uh, describing what astronomers are trying to do. Let's see if we can get the computer to go. So uh, this is what I was describing. We have a, a, uh, some understanding of how this process all works. And then, of course, we'd like to say, how is it possible that the physical conditions lead to living things? And this little mite with all its legs and whiskers is a pretty remarkable example of life also. Uh, but um, I'd, I like to say the astronomers have the easy part of this problem because we actually have a chance to see all of the things that I'm describing and because we can look back in time. We can see things as they were. And the biologists can't. Well, we, we have ways of estimating and thinking about the past, uh, but... Uh, if there was, a, for instance, another kind of life here on Earth before our kind came here, we ate it, or our ancestors <laughs> ate it. So it's not there to find, and we're not going to be able to, we're not going to get at that. So, but uh, we can, astronomers, uh, still surprise you. Uh, when you look in the mirror in the morning, you're looking at the inside of exploded stars. And this is a little bit surprising, but where, how else is this going to be? People don't usually step back and say, well, how did those atoms in front of me get here? Um, but we can tell you from the uh, story of the Big Bang that there were no carbon, oxygen, iron, sulfur atoms there in the Big Bang material. So where did they come from? They had to be made later. They were made inside stars that blew up and exploded. That's redundant. Uh, and uh, let their material out into space after nuclear reactions had processed hydrogen and helium into the other chemical elements. So we're here uh, because other stars blew up. Uh, so catastrophe is part of our history. In fact, the Earth was probably made uh, with elements that came from several tens or hundreds or even thousands of other stars that blew up and the material got mixed together over the course of time. So uh, anyway, if, uh, if you had told Aristotle that there was a Big Bang, he would have been able to ask this question, well, if the Big Bang only had hydrogen and helium, where's the rest? And he might have been able to say, well, I don't know stuff what those little sparkly things are in the sky, but maybe they made them. You could imagine Aristotle could have done that. So uh, I mentioned that we do look back in time. As astronomers, we are the only ones who can, really. Uh, we look at things that are far away and therefore far back in time. And light travels at the uh, um, remarkable speed of, what is it, six trillion miles a year or one foot per nanosecond. Uh, at any rate, if I see the end of my arm, it's as it was three nanoseconds ago. If I look all the way out to the most distant things that we could possibly see, we can almost see into the Big Bang. And when I made this chart, it was a long time ago, and we hadn't got a measurement. Um, but we thought then it was 15 billion years ago, and so 15 billion light years out into space, that you have to look 
now it's 13.7. Uh, so we got pretty close with that guess. So um, now you say, well, okay, astronomers, how do you know how far away you're looking? So this is a chart that just explains that uh, we do it the way the surveyors did it, and you've, if you took high school trigonometry or geometry, uh, this is what you would have learned in that class. We do surveying. If you can draw a triangle, and if you know one arm of the triangle and two angles of the triangle, then you know the whole shape of the triangle. So uh, that's how um, the ancient Greeks measured the size of the Earth, and they also got a pretty good estimate of the distance to the moon uh, because they figured this out. But the angles they needed to measure to measure the distance to the sun are too small, and they couldn't figure that out. They got the wrong answer. So the second method that we have is also basically a geometrical method, but it says if you look at two things and you believe that they're intrinsically the same, and one is fainter than the other, then it's because it's farther away. And this is the inverse square law uh, that we use, and uh, this is a lot harder than it looks. And the reason that it's a lot harder is the assumption that I made at the beginning, that two things are identical. Uh, they might look identical and not be. So we've been fooled a lot of times. Uh, so next thing you want to know is how fast are things moving? Well, uh, planets and uh, star uh, planets and the moon and the asteroids and comets, they move rapidly across the sky over the course of years. And the um, name of planet actually, I think, means wanderer in ancient Greek. Um, so, uh, but what do you do for the stuff that doesn't move fast enough to, for you to notice, even with your modern equipment? Uh, the other thing you can do is tell if it's going towards you or away from uh, you by, uh, by the color of the light that we receive. This is called the Doppler shift. Uh, the picture here shows the spectra of distant stars. Uh, if you spread out the, line, the sunlight or the uh, light from a, uh, uh, a light bulb that's been passed through a gaseous material, um, there will be marks across the spectrum, and we call them spectrum lines, um, that are characteristic of the chemical elements in the gaseous material. So we get a picture of the sun that looks sort of like this with marks across it. Uh, we get uh, a spectrum of a distant star, and the spectrum is similar, except the wavelengths are all shifted in a particular way. They're all proportional. So you say, well, what would make that happen? That's because the objects coming toward us are going away from us. So we're now able to do this with astonishing precision. Uh, in some cases, we're able to measure changes of the speed of a star that are a meter per second. A meter per second, you know, going like this. And we do that. Uh, that's really handy if you want to find out if there's a planet pulling on a distant star. So this is just an introduction to planet finding is, is included in this picture, although that's not why we drew it. So now I want to tell you about the Big Bang. Uh, it was discovered in 1929. Uh, and so we, people still are skeptical. They say, well, how can that Big Bang happen? Uh, I don't believe this story. Well, in 1929, Edwin Hubble drew this chart, and uh, I have to tell you what's on it. Um, this is a graph, and on the horizontal direction is the distance of distant galaxies. On the vertical direction is the speed. So uh, uh, this 1929, the same year that, by the way, the, uh, we discovered the economy could collapse. Uh, in 1929, we also discovered the universe could expand. And so the, each of these dots or circles is a galaxy, and you see there's a trend here. And it's pretty well described by a straight line. So that says, okay, you can now measure the age of your universe the way that it seems to you, divide the distance by the speed. So that was it. Got the age of the universe from that picture. Um, now, there was a trouble at that time because Edwin Hubble was fooled. The, the way he was using to measure distance was standard candles, and he saw these little blinking lights. The, uh, they're called Cepheid variable stars that change characteristic time. And he said, I see them here and I see them there, so over there is so much farther away than here. It just turned out that the standard candles were not the same kind in the two different places. So we were fooled. Uh, and the uh, universe appeared to be quite young, just a few billion years because uh, this, of this error. And a little while longer, uh, a little while passed, and we began to realize that this was an implausibly young age for the universe because we can date the, eventually we could date the Earth. We knew the Earth was older than the universe. This is a problem. Um, <laughs> Uh, later on, uh, later on, uh, we could date the uh, ages of star clusters, and uh, they were again older than the universe, and is a problem. So uh, this has been confusing for a long time. So people said, well, in that case, how about some other theory? So we got steady state theory and other kinds of theories that were kind of radical, even more radical than this one. Uh, so um, let me tell you some stories about the discovery and the interpretation of, the, of all these things. Uh, back in 1905, this guy, Albert Einstein, gave his 
the special theory of relativity and gave you the th story that there's a maximum speed of motion, gave you E equals mc squared. Um, but that wasn't the whole thing because he realized that uh, the, uh, the way gravitation works, you could actually include it into relativity, but you would have to call it the general theory of relativity. And, uh, and in that case, then uh, gravitation works by bending and warping space and time. And so uh, this was a hard thing to work on, but in 1916 he gave us these equations, which we still use and believe uh, are true. Uh, and he's, and, and then he, as, as he did that, he also thought about the universe and the expanding universe or not. Uh, all of his astronomers' friends said, oh, the universe is static. It's always been like this. Well, how did they know? They didn't know. They just thought. Uh, so, um, in order to make his equations come out, uh, he had to do something to balance the attractive force of the gravitation, all the galaxies pulling on each other, with something that he introduced to balance it so the universe could be stable. So he had a repulsive force as well as the attractive force, and it seemed right to him. So that was 1916. In 1922, this young man, Alexander Friedman, was working in what's now uh, St. Petersburg again in uh, Russia, Petersburg. Um, and he said, you know, I can apply these equations and I get a different answer. I think that that was an unstable situation and that the universe has to be expanding and that it was much denser in the beginning. And uh, that was 22. I believe he lived three more years before the plague got him. So he was a very young fellow. He didn't get to find out that he was right. Um, a few years later, it was five years later in 1927, this young man here, uh, Georges Lemaitre, uh, another mathematician and physicist uh, applied uh, Einstein's equations again and got the same answer. Tried to get his answers, his articles published. Einstein said it was wrong. Einstein's already famous. Uh, not only is it wrong, he says, um, uh, the equations are okay, but you're a bad physicist. So uh, two years after that, of course, Einstein had to apologize when the expanding universe was uh, discovered. And um, I don't know whether he was fully apologetic or not, but... At any rate, uh, now we knew that the universe is indeed expanding, and these guys were right. <clears throat> so um, now a few other people that are heroes in this chart. Uh, George Gamow came to, uh, the, um, to Washington, D.C. Uh, from the Ukraine, and in uh, 1948, after the World War was over, we began to know a lot more nuclear physics than we used to know, and he started to say, well, how about we figure out the conditions of this Big Bang? So they worked on the nuclear reactions that would occur, and they also calculated that it should be filled, uh, that the universe should be filled with a residual heat, uh, what's left over from the Big Bang. So these gen young men here, uh, graduate student and a postdoctoral fellow at that time, um, they worked out this calculation. They predicted that the universe should be filled with heat radiation from the Big Bang at a temperature of about 5 degrees Kelvin, uh, which is pretty remarkably good considering how little we really knew in those days. <clears throat> so... They also understood that the universe is mostly hydrogen and helium, and the, that's how the predictions come out. So uh, they were able to say, okay, this is now a testable prediction of the Big Bang Theory, and they couldn't get anybody to go test it at that time. It was probably too hard. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, didn't know. <clears throat> um, so now I want to explain, however, a few consequences of the Big Bang idea. Uh, I've got my three astronomers here. Uh, and the labels are drawn from the perspective of the one on the left here. Um, this is the expanding universe as seen by uh, our three astronomers. This one says, okay, I see the tortoise and I see the hare and I can divide the speed by the distance and uh, my expanding universe started one hour ago. Okay, now imagine that you're uh, the tortoise astronomer. You look over here, you see um, this, uh, you would, uh, this is one kilometer per hour difference from here to here, okay. Tortoise says, okay, my universe is also one hour old. We all started together one hour ago. There's no grass in outer space, so they don't know who's standing. So the conclusion from this chart is there's no center of the universe. And, uh, you know, this is really shocking. Are you, after I give my talk, almost every time somebody says, where was it? <laughs> well, there wasn't a center, as far as we can tell. We have been looking, and there is still no sign that there's any place in the sky that's really significantly different from any other to say that that's the beginning or the center of anything. And that's because we're on the inside. You cannot look at the universe from the outside. And that means I cannot draw you a picture. This is my best picture of the exploding universe. Um, so I'm sorry, but we need to be beings in, say, 
5, 10, 11 dimensional space to be able to stand outside the universe and look at it and say it was over there. So, but we're inside, we can't do that. <laughs>